Paul Knight was knee deep in production. He'd become a pawn in the mugs game. He'd written the script, but he didn't know what was happening behind the scenes. He began to cast his blockbuster with a new budget from Bashar of under 100 grand. Not that that stopped him going after some big names. Trying to find a strong British actress that was known, that was in the late 30s bracket, that you wasn't going to be paying Hollywood money for, was tough. When I was describing the character of Audrey to my wife while writing, she flicked on the TV to Loose Women, and she said, you've just described this woman, and it was Andrea McLean. Oxford dictionaries have revealed their word of the year. It's something long, hard to pronounce, something long, hard. So I just contacted her agent and I said, look, I know she doesn't act, but I've got this film, we're shooting this month. And the agent said, well, I'll pass on the script to her. And then I got an email direct from Andrea. She said, look, I haven't acted, but I would kick myself if I turn around an opportunity. Um, she said, I can't guarantee I'm going to be any good. And it was like, well, for what you've read, I can work with. And that's how we got her involved. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's in the kind of film game and just said, um, Danny, there's a part come up. Are you available? Um, the director's seen your work. He's happy for you to play it. Um, are you available? Do you want to come along and do it? I said, send me over the script. I saw the script. Um, it was a bit of a um, PA secretary part, which is kind of different to what I normally play. So I was like, great, show a bit of variety and get involved. Paul came to me, I was working in a bar in Soho and he literally just offered me the role. He had me, you know, down for playing Tess in, in the, in the uh, film and, you know, working with the calibre of actors that he was uh, showcasing to me. I was like, yeah, man, bang in there, kind of thing. So, yeah, so it was a great opportunity and I love how Paul writes. Like, he's like a modern day, you know, uh, uh, urban Shakespeare. I Try, I try and keep it flowing as far to the end as possible. I mean, we did um, on the rough draft that did. We had a quick read through. I want that land, <coughs> and you're going to sell it to me. And um, why would I do that? Because you're a smart man. You have a lovely family, great home. Do you want to keep that? Are you threatening me? Did you hear me threatening you? I think you've seen too many gangster movies. You look around this city, and you can't throw a stone without hitting something that is there because of me. I make no bones that in my past I've done bad things. I run with bad people, it was in certain crowds, we did things. And my wife criticises my work because she says I don't put no heart into my characters. I live in a world where that's because I know there is no heart. You know what I mean? That is for soppy love stories. That's not the real world. The real world, this is how it is. But I do know that a film's got to have four bottles and one oh fuck moment. Mr. Ward of the Land isn't for sale. Construction <coughs> is already underway. Then change them and find somewhere else to build, or you will find out just how far my influences go. No, no, I think it's you that's watched too many gangster films. I don't watch gangster films. I'm the fucking evil bastard that they all are based on. I think you better leave now before I call security. Shut up, you fucking muppet. These are lines, in all fairness, that I have said to people in a previous life, if you like. Um, because, uh, Paul thought this film was his big break, his reward for going straight. But it's hard to leave the place you've come from. Maybe it was a sixth sense. But the last detail, just before shooting, Paul added a final correction to the script, removing one letter from the title. A landscape of lives became a landscape of lies. Scene 32, state one, take six. <laughs>